Are you good? Okay, great. So I'll quickly jump in. Um, introductions, real quickly. Uh, my name is Brandon Young. Uh, I lead up um, partnerships, alliances, and f pretty much anything external for uh, a company called GitLab. Uh, up to about three months ago, I built out the ecosystem for Google Cloud Platform. So uh, an area that we have a lot of questions. Most of this, what I wanted to go through is a lot of trends and things that we're seeing from some about how we, there's a development. So I think there's some patterns here around the open source development model uh, that we've sort of taken to an extreme. So I think might be really interesting for people to have some context to uh, how we go about doing that. And then second off, I want to spend some time with uh, some what we're seeing trends with customers uh, and how open source kind of comes together. Because we tend to talk about oftentimes open source as separate projects. And while the individual projects are wonderful, um, I was on the founding team for Kubernetes, like that's a great project. But as you guys may have seen earlier, now there's Prometheus and there's you know, uh, Istio and there's a thousand other projects that fit to it. And so sometimes while that's a fascinating exercise, mental exercise, the question is how does this really come together? So one of the areas we're gonna, we're gonna chat about mostly is around the dev tool space. Uh, a couple things and I'll show you what we're doing. Uh, just some good reference points here and you're welcome to jump in this. Uh, this actually comes from Joe's, Joseph Jacks who's just founded an open source uh, investment company called OSS Capital. Really good to follow, but this is sort of the tiers, not like this is a huge surprise. This is generally how open source business models sort of evolve. Uh, I think they should at the very top have like acquired by IBM, you know, <laughs> by IBM or Microsoft or something, right? So eventually you fall off or you jump off the top. I should say jump off the top, not fall off the top uh, into the arms of maybe the company. So uh, an interesting comment there. Uh, what I thought though I'd do is um, we take at GitLab this sort of to an extreme um, and it's based predominantly around, uh, uh, comes pretty much out of our core uh, values of collaboration and transparency. But you probably should be like, that's nice, how fascinating is, is, is this? So we operate in a model uh, for what it's worth and I'll explain what you're looking at here. Uh, ours is we're the open core model. So we completely open source GitLab, anyone in the world can use GitLab. Uh, there's a core model, free, completely um, MIT licensed, so very open that route. Um, the other thing though as a company though, we actually operate completely transparently. And so it, I would example on that when someone's like, oh, it's transparent, that's nice. We have no company or we have no offices. So this has forced us because we have no offices, we have uh, employees in 43 countries, um, and we believe at our core that everyone can contribute. So that's what our, our core belief is that everyone can contribute. Well, how do you fit everyone can contribute with a completely distributed model, right? Well, it's very simple. You must document everything, right? And so we actually document not only everything that we do, and I'll give you a little, some taste of what we do in the, um, in the project itself, but we actually document everything. This is open source. We have a whole bunch of open source companies that use this. This is part of what's called a handbook. It's now running at about 1,000 pages, and we document everything we do in the company from beginning to end. So this is my onboarding document. So this is public, everyone can see. Obviously links in here are there, obviously some of them are private, so if you clicked on them they wouldn't be there. But literally this is an entire 256 page or uh, step, step by step check process for onboarding and your training, everything else you would need. So we take this to an extreme because it's really important that we believe that when you're disconnected from not sitting in the same office next to someone, uh, it actually helps a lot from, uh, or it really forces a level of documentation and communication that um, has allowed us to move much faster as a company than anyone had thought possible. So uh, this is something that's really interesting. It's an open source, it's really open source business model as well. Uh, so we have a bunch of other companies that both contribute to the entire way we run the business as well as the way they contribute. And so some interesting stuff, um, there. Uh, the other area that we spend a bunch of time on uh, is documentation. Whoop, let me take this back. Is we document um, everything we do in the entire process. So if you, there's a core uh, business anyone can use, but even if you're paying, we have you know, premium, premium versions, uh, everyone in the world can see that. So they know what code they're using, uh, they can contribute into it. If they contribute into it and they want it in the core, we move it in the core. So everyone in the world can use that open source um, world. So our entire product roadmap and everything else sits out here for everyone to see. So a little bit different aspect, uh, kind of a different take on the whole open source, uh, not just a business model, but how we actually um, run the business. So let me go back into presentation mode here for a sec, just so you can see it. 
Um, the areas, though, that we've seen in this, so the question and sort of a highlight, and so we'll get to, but I want to set some context, is in the world of tooling, first off, uh, you know, I think John here was joking about, hey, DevOps, yeah, everyone calls that different. So I will actually go through what we define as a DevOps lifecycle, uh, but it's not so much a definition, everyone can debate that, there's plenty of ways of, of thinking of DevOps. Um, a lot of what we are seeing is the really big challenges we're seeing for companies is how do I adopt a thousand tools, right? How do I deal with the fact that every single developer that walks in has their own opinionated place that they want to start with a tool? Um, and how do I move quickly as a company to deploy to that? So this is a pattern we're seeing, um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of our customers focus on a couple things. First off, they really want to shift left, which means give more decision-making process to your developers. This is not a new trend. I think everyone is very familiar with this, but this is a trend um, that exists. Uh, we have a live broadcast. You're welcome to watch Michael walk you through this from Charter Communications on how they thought through it. Um, but it's all about being able to move and deploy quickly. Uh, and that's kind of the challenges that uh, are seen. The other one they've seen is what we call a tool tax. And it's not a tool tax. There's a whole bunch of ways, and we'll dig into what customers are saying tool tax means. Um, but the real issue is uh, directors are having to deal with uh, tools that everyone brings in. And especially if they start a new project, OK, if I let my own team go do whatever they want, how do I end up carrying that weight once that project becomes something I have to support, right? Uh, we're spending a lot of time also like with the Linux Foundation even is dealing with this at its core. As they take on more and more projects, every project comes in with its opinionated tool set. Um, most of those continue to be open source, uh, but they do vary. So there's a good number, obviously, in the Git, Git space, there's only one open source Git um, option, which is GitLab. The others are all closed source. So uh, a little bit different challenge there. And then that just affects the speed. So as you start going through a tool chain, your tool chain kind of looks something, and I'll actually go back to this in a sec. Um, tool chain, everyone wants to actually get to this, so we'll go fast. This is sort of what you might look like as a tool chain today. Um, I would look kind of from left to right to give you a sense of this. Everyone has their planning page. They're going to have an area that they've got to do create and manage. They've got to verify, they've got a package distribution, they're going to have a release space, they're going to have a configuration, monitoring, securing. This is just a small piece, so I just sort of took a number of the core tool sets that people uh, look at, and this is what they're looking at. The arrow is the important on the bottom part. Every one of these is an integration point, right? And that tends to be the biggest challenge that they face is, it's called, we call it the integration tax. So, this is the tax that everyone has to pay every time one of these tools changes. And it's not just the integration between one tool and another tool, it's integration that that implies then to another tool. So think of it this way. If you have good data coming between two tools but that breaks, you also lose all the data downstream or upstream from your DevOps lifecycle. So you kind of lose that entire value chain. And so companies naturally spend an enormous amount of time arguing about which tool they want to use updating the tools that they want to use, figuring out whether or not can deploy to you know, the new Kubernetes environment, or that they need to put that into you know, a core you know, legacy Unix environment. All of those are questions that people are spending an enormous amount of time on, but at the end of the day is like, hey, it didn't ship code, right? Uh, you gotta ship the code. So the other area that we see when we say a tool tax is something we call a developer tax. Um, what we see on this one is the number of context switching that a developer might live in. And so if the developer is, if we go back for a sec, if a developer is opening the issue in JIRA, uh, deploying it into, their, into a GitHub um, repo, handling and building and constructing their Jenkins pipeline, handing that off to the artifact, JFrog artifactory, and then trying to make sure that they can configure that onto their machine using Chef, how many places do you just put your developer, right? And I'm guessing here, anyone having an easy job hiring people? And if you do, like seriously well done, I don't know what you're doing, but this is the hardest problem is our developers, as we said, the shift left means they have a lot more power, it means they have a lot more say, and it means that also their, their time is the most valuable resource we sit on, full stop. So how do we help them in, um, deal with it? Well. Sort of how this has played out for the developer. So if you flip the tool chain, this looks, this look is what you would if you're an IT admin or you're the IT director. Like, oh no, I have to pay for all these tools, I have to manage them. True cost. 
Still not your most expensive cost. Your big cost is the developer tax on the context switching we just talked about. And generally, this is actually the world. Um, I came from Google, so I'm opinionated. I'm using an example. Uh, I will fully acknowledge that Microsoft Word has moved its way forward. But generally speaking, I'm sure a few of us have lived in this world for a number of times, right? One person at a time, you have multiple copies, you have to merge them back together, you have to make sure, oh crap, that was a good day, that was a good, you changed that slide, how does that fit to my slide? Or you redlined, but how does that fit my redline? Redline is a little bit easier. You have the version conflict. Um, we'd suggest maybe the world might look a little more like Google Docs, right? Go in the same place, everyone into the same place, everyone knew exactly where it's running, everyone be speaking the same language. Um, this is the nirvana that everyone thinks and they want to get to, um, but they do have one other tax they have to pay, and that's what I would call the data tax. So data tax is gonna be easiestly, most easily understood uh, from what we're seeing from customers in an example. So I'm gonna take you through incident management, and I'll kind of explain this as we go through it, and you'll start, think about where all the data comes, to, comes from that you would need to handle in an incident management, for example, right? So first off, you're gonna need some really good monitoring because you might wanna know exactly when that API is hitting either errors or not delivering at this time. So hey, by the way, just gotta be able to correlate your monitoring data back into the source repo because something changed and you have to understand how those two fit together. One piece of data. Hey, by the way, you better know who it is and who's made who the people are because you need an incident manager, you need a response, and by the way, you're gonna to need to know which teams made the commits into that Git repository, right? You're probably gonna to need to make sure that you have easy ways to communicate, make sure that that would be integrated. Each one of these, remember, is a separate place if you're trying to handle it separately. Then you needed your ops flow. So this is gonna be really important to know who's doing what to either roll back, so we're just gonna assume simplicity sake this is a rollback, right? Who do, you have to, who do you have to contact, who has to be in place to do your rollback from the incident you're dealing with, right? You're gonna to need to know, ideally, um, on an ops flow, you're gonna know where the run books, so you need to make sure that you have full access to your run books, because you're gonna to have to roll those back. By the way, while you're doing the troubleshooting, you're gonna to wanna to have good understanding of all of your error graphs and the timeline, particularly here, in terms of where updates were, either that you're updating now or what got committed in your Git repository before, right? Might be also really important to have in the context you might want to have some of the follow-up if you have to do further mitigation. Hey, here's the issues. How do we resolve them? What are we to make ch to change the run books? And then, obviously, the last one is just a context in terms of whether that performance is back up and running, right? So back to kind of your monitoring logging. This is just at a high level. How do we know what the heck's going on here, right? And so historically, that's kind of the tool tax. And I don't know, is anyone a developer in the room? Okay, so. I'm gonna ask you, I do some development, but for those of you that raise your hand, is this real? Yeah, so we call that holistically a DevOps tool tax. It's the integration, the support tax, this is a developer tax, it's a data tax. These are all new things that we're seeing, and I'll give you a little context of how we ran into it. Um, historically, if, so I should probably just explain, I, I was trying not, this is just telling you what's going on in the industry, but context-wise, uh, GitLab started as a Git repository. Huge surprise to everyone. I'm sure everyone's like, GitLab, what in the world do you do? Um, we started as a Git repository. We took a very opinion, initially we looked at the world the same way everyone else does, which is be the very best, whatever you are in your silo, be the very best you can be, right? S small tools, sharp. Small, sharp tools, be great there. So we actually started, hey, we're gonna start at private Git repositories because, well, let's be honest, GitHub did an awesome job, right? So don't go, don't go compete on the same, uh, same space that someone's always doing. Well, find a market that needs to be underserved. Uh, and that was private Git repository. So we started there in about 2012. We actually then also started in 2014 a CI tool, so continuous integration tool, and we kept them separate. Like, hey, these are two separate subjects, or two different products, uh, similar to what you might see with a HashiCorp, right? So HashiCorp's got Terraform, they've got Vault, and they've got you know, Packer, and they've got you know, Console, um, and I'm missing two of their projects, but I'll remember them probably halfway through. Uh, what we did is we actually started having customers about two, three years ago saying, hey, can we run them together? And when we started running them together, that's when we kind of had the aha moment. 
because customers are saying, I can actually see the visibility, I start seeing visibility back into this. And so this is kind of where our vision is, is to help customers bring that entire CI uh, and DevOps tool chain. So uh, not surprisingly, um, I didn't put this up here, but these are all areas that we spend a bunch of time on. The other area that's really emerging, in particular that's really helpful and goes back to uh, the developer tax, so a little bit more, I'm completely breaking every way you're supposed to do a presentation here, is security, right? And so what's really important in, uh, is to customers is their ability to do security vulnerabilities real time for your developer, right? And what that means is, is the developer is able, every time they hit a commit, that you're able to run these security, the security tools across them. It means that you get obviously more secure code. Yay, bonus. But second, your developer is getting that real time feedback. Um, I'm gonna pick on developers in the room again. Has anyone made the commit into, and then it goes off to security land? And how long, how long does it take until you get answers back as to whether that code you wrote was secure? Not even half secure. Right, so if you did, <laughs> I don't wanna say it. Oftentimes it's weeks, like it can be weeks for them to do the scanning, give the data back, and then you become this cycle, right? Then the life cycle becomes, oh, okay, I, honestly, I coded that literally a week or two ago, okay, or longer. Now I gotta go back and adjust it. And so now you're creating both context switching plus velocity, plus you're also not helping them become better coders, right? So if you can really put the linting, the security, all those tools right in line when they're making the commits, now you're hitting inside of you know, seconds, you're getting that feedback to your developers, right? Um, another one, and I wanna, I'll, I'll highlight them, and he can speak to it, Wayne up here in the, I need to cut down on slides. So uh, I'll use an example, but Wayne is here, is with Beacon Technology. Um, so they do uh, uh, enable customers, so they're really worked on a cloud-based, um, you can read it here, but for the financials, a production platform for your financial services needs. Um, specifically, his team is focused on this at a, even a higher level in really the financial services area. So they built a whole bunch uh, of additional tooling on top of it. But they use, and they use a similar model, a transparent code, meaning their end customers have full transparency to their code and what's running in it so they can make contributions back. If they wanna make an adjustment or they see a vulnerability or whatever, contribute it right back, comes re immediately back into the code. Um, but the reason I bring this up, and Wayne can speak to this, you guys should chat, Wayne, raise your hand, because I'm like Wayne as if no one knows who Wayne is. That's Wayne. Uh, yeah, is the code base continues to get more consistent too. So when you add a new developer, if you put in good security, good linting, you're leveraging this full tool set, when your developer shows up, they know exactly the style of code that it's written in, they know exactly what the expectations are, and the tooling helps them code consistently. So your entire company is writing similar code, easily readable, um, meeting all the other expectations you might have. And so that speed of deployment, we all talk about it, but is really hampered by your tool set depending on how you'd handle it. And so um, this was not our expectation. The reason we kind of chatted about this is, again, we didn't actually expect this. When we started, we went down the path of a bunch of small tools do them really well, make sure you're the best in class, private Git repository. We're like, yes, nailed it. They're like, oh, we might do some CI, and it turns out that that was pretty important, and so we doubled down on it. Uh, and that's kind of been the evolution we're seeing our customers go through very much the same world um, as they're dealing with it. Wayne, we're small enough. Any comments or anything else you feel important to add? You, you talked about putting the linting and giving that developer feedback. Yeah. Um, for us, that, that goes a step further. Our, our code is our product to an extent. Because it's transparent to our clients, because our clients work with us in extensions. They know if you write bad code, because they get to see it. Yes, and that doesn't help our sales cycle, it doesn't help our feedback cycle. One of the big challenges we had is we had to clean up our entire code base to get it consistent. And we didn't want junior developers having to come in and refactor an entire possibly complex financial object file. By, by using GitLab and by putting stuff in in stages. We didn't have to go from here to here in one move. We were able to go for, okay, today we're gonna to turn the linting on for the scope of your change, plus two lines either side. And GitLab let us do that. So we could have a guy who needs to make a change. They could make that change without having to be, without having to refactor the entire file just to get it past linting. But their code was already consistent to the new standards. 
So it's tools like that that have definitely helped us, not just with the quality of our product, but with how our product appears to our clients. Yeah. So a lot of this, by the way, have an opinionated tool set. I think to be crystal clear, what I'm trying to say is we're just an example. We've come to this conclusion as a company, but I think the commentary in this is I think there's a, a nature when we hear shift left or the notion that developers are now of control. What we've seen is initially people move way too far left and then they have to come back. So if each development team gets their own choices, which we do want to give them choices and we want to track them, you're going to end up at the end of the day handling that tool chain tax. So there's a trade-off that we're trying to weigh and functionally that's what a lot of this talk was today going to go through is it's one we've run into front and center. Um, obviously, we deal with it because of we're a company, and so, but it's the exact same pattern we see internally to companies again and again and again. Um, I can't tell you how many companies run literally three different types of source code management in just Git. And by the way, there are only really three Git options, GitHub, GitLab, and Atlassian. Those are really the only three you have. In, there's, I, I can name five companies off the top of my head that literally have all three running in their company at the same time. Um, challenging to run with that. And so standardize on them, whichever one that is. Um, and obviously from an open source standpoint, I think the other part is we've seen um, working with Beacon and similar companies, that's kind of the model that we've landed on. It's not right for everyone. I'm sure there's different ways of handling it, of course. But having the, whether it's transparent source or us in uh, uh, open core, uh, that's something that has proven to be really, really valuable in getting feedback uh, and open a lot of that transparency. So, um, yep. Um, another thing that I would say is uh, another thing that we kind of ended up with, which I would, a pattern I think you could use for sure, is uh, convention over configuration. And what I mean by that is have an opinion and not just, hey, anyone can figure anything you want. So. The way we play out with this is we start with an opinion, for example, for a customer, right? We say, hey, customer, hey, you have all these different pieces that you need to bring together. We're gonna to bring an opinionated tool that helps you guys solve that, but we're actually gonna give you stuff out of the box that you start with. So they would start with, if we say something, we call it something called auto DevOps, because it's just fun to call everything DevOps, right? Um, actually, in fairness, we called it DevOps before Azure called it DevOps. So we like to think they came after us I'm not sure that actually happened. They have obviously been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but we start with an opinion, and I would say this is a pattern that's also really useful. If you have a group particularly, anyone have new development teams that are started or have asked you or want to, give them an opinion. Like literally give them a full opinion from a tool chain. So I'm just gonna give an example, for example. When we look at it, we look, hey, you should have an auto build. You should have a very clear build option on this. Um, we happen to use something similarly, use Docker files and something that's similar to Heroku. Uh, in helping package up that uh, the application. Give them testing, give them quality immediately in there with the quality scans. Make sure you set up all the development or the, uh, the uh, security view. So, hey, get them static application security testing. Make sure they have vulnerability static analysis, dynamic application security testing. There's a bunch of tools out there. But give them to them right off the bat because otherwise everyone knows if the developer doesn't have it, they will go make their own decision. The truth is they would love for you to hand this to them if it has all the pieces in it. Make sure you're handing them all those pieces and not letting them go, I should say this, there may be places you explore and give them freedom, so that's not what I'm trying to say. Just know there's a tax you will be paying on the back end if there's an opinion you start on the front end. So this is what we do is we give a, whole, uh, a default and auto dev a whole bunch of you know opinionated ways of doing it that you can just go in and tweak all you want. And so that gives them a, uh, a, um, a white, you know, or a, sorry, a, a platform for them to start with, and then as they want to tweak that up or down, change out one tool or um, scanning or something or another, or they have a different dev. In this case, you know, we happen to use for monitoring, we use a Prometheus, but there's a whole bunch of really good monitoring options that may already be in place that they would want to use. Nonetheless, we start with an opinion for someone to start. So. I think I am right about five minutes early so we can have questions, which had been my goal. Any questions? Yeah. You mentioned uh, while shifting left that there's a good possibility to shift too far left. Sure. Can you give an example uh, of what you're telling there? I'm giving it, too much back to the developers or what I'm 
Um, yeah, so when on, on the shift left, so let me take, um, try to think if I can say this one. So uh, there's a large investment bank that is currently um, wanted to move fast. So went for the direction like, hey, hey, we're gonna go fast, had a lot of really smart developers. Um, what ended up happening is a couple of the two core development pieces ended up being two pieces of the platform they wanted to pull together. Been really hard because those two teams had totally different development life cycles, just even, they weren't even, even both using Git, for example, one, which is fine, right? So they just ended up later down the path because you know you had an opinionated, they didn't give a standard for someone to start with. They now have a whole bunch of different tools. And initially they didn't think the two platforms more or less they were developing were gonna come together. As they came together, that's, you know, now they're going back and having to refactor and you know make a lot of choices. And some of this is just a nature of development, right? So I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. Um, but it's particularly painful if you give a small team uh, license to choose any tools they want because they may be a small team becomes a bigger team, that small team may not still be there, and then, then where do you go with it? So, so you're, you're uh, identifying shifting left, left with letting or giving the back the decision uh, to a lower or to a yes. left Yes. Yeah, so shift left meaning letting the developer, that, that the decisions on what gets built, okay. particularly more of what gets built than tools. So I would suggest, give obviously keep giving your developers, get them closer to whoever your end customer is, okay. right? No, 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 I guess. But not necessarily just be aware of what you're doing for a tool, right? Um, we're chatting, for example, with uh, the Linux Foundation and they've been handed, for example, <laughs> Uh, great donations and people say, here's my code, right? And here's some dollars to maintain it. Uh, the problem is the Linux Foundation's like, look, we don't support every tool that everyone's ever created. Uh, they have a doubly big challenge because that's all core developers, right? So each development team comes in, you know, the Kubernetes team has a whole bunch of opinions, the Prometheus team has an opinion, and each one has their tool set, which they want to hand to the Linux Foundation and say, hey, run it for us. And the Linux Foundation's like, so wait, I've got now, you know, they're even worse because they'd maybe like 45 tool sets that then they have to manage, they have to update, they have to maintain. And so um, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty real. It's a lot more real than I, I think I'd realized. And a lot more real, and the other thing is for me, it's real, a lot more real than when I was at Google, there was an opinionated way for everything no matter what, which has a plus and minus, I'm sure. But the plus of it is everyone, took a while for everyone to get on the same page. The learning overhead for a Google developer, for example, is a good three to six months. But then everyone is developing on the same page, right? They're hammering through and when they deploy code, everyone's talking the same language, everyone's doing linting the same way. So you can switch developers between code bases, right? So that's the other piece I would say is if you have developers, if you think that developer is gonna live and breathe on one project, like you're kidding yourself because they're not. So how, if they're not interchangeable, so if you have a team that's using a completely different tool set, and another team that's using a different tool set, how do they both talk together, but more importantly, hey, how do you load balance, right? If you want a good back-end engineer, and you have to switch them over to another team, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you solve that problem, right? And the truth is then you get a bunch of siloed devs, right? So. Sure. Sure. UI change, internet based change, or and trying to get that into one DevOps channel is near on impossible. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I'm, obviously, Wayne can chat through. The, the way we're seeing most customers is just trying to move. Start with an opinion. Like you're not going to solve your back. Like there's a backlog. It is what it is. It runs your business. It probably makes you a bunch of money. That's why you're doing what you're doing. But introduce something new so each new development moves. And like, actually this was the fun, and Wayne's like, isn't everyone doing this? So you guys don't have to say if you do or don't do it. But when I was first chatting with Wayne, he's like, so we made this switch and we're slowly eating away at our backlog in terms of you know, uh, quality, debt, the debt in, in the core base. But they didn't start there, right? They just started with everything new going through uh, uh, a new opinionated tool chain with all of the linting. Most importantly, like I said, just apply the tools Whatever those tools are, apply them. Uh, and we've just seen, that's something that we've seen, your, your pattern is one that we're seeing across the board of, hey, 
we don't have to go back and resolve every problem because there are going to be the problem. That's the wrong way. There's a process that's being done. Introducing a new process, fine. Just probably try not to introduce five new processes. Um, and also try, because here's the thing. As a dev, we all have opinions, right? So the devs in the room, what's your favorite tool? I know, I know he's got it because he's got a bunch of stickers on it. So he can, you can know his dev tools. <laughs> There's his dev tools, right? Because they're going to slap them on their, on their laptop. And so what happens too on that, which is challenging, then you become holy wars. It's the puppet versus chef versus Ansel Bush's HashiCorp. You're like, okay, awesome. All useful, like all useful, probably not worth having a uh, really strong debate on that. But the problem becomes once you put those, I think three, those are in three, no, two languages. One's Go, Go and Ruby, I think are the only two you gotta solve there. But then you start going languages even in, even in, that, in that space, right? Oh, it's Python 3, yeah, sorry, yes. So there you go, now three, and so, you know, where that fits. Uh, it also makes it hard to hire, and again, it help, makes it difficult to move developers between uh, tools. I suspect some of this is you're all familiar with, so they're not huge ahas, I've never heard it, just we, um, we've seen this become something that's really critical over the last, you know, year and a half or two years, and it, um, we've seen companies do it really well, but it is not easy. Other questions? Yes. So, you know, I can easily walk through a development group on mm -hmm. busy days and see frustrated developers spending 50% of their time screwing around with tools instead of developing. Yep. All right, so this is kind of what this is all about. And what I find is that my DevOps team is on the one end, like they know how to deploy to the cloud and keep the cloud running and all that. Yep. I have developers that kind of know they kind of both know, you know, Jenkins a little bit, but there's no like end-to-end -end person. So, yeah. Do you assign like so you're the gap that's bridged and they're not meeting? You know, they're building roads that meet like this. Yep. And so you have yeah, your dev teams, so your dev teams over here, and your ops teams over there. Yeah, and there's no one like complete end-to-end, -end. and in the end, you need a systems engineer to understand this system. Mm -hmm. Complete end-to-end. -end. Do you end up hiring someone whose sole responsibility is end to end here? Who's not DevOps and not development, but pure like, you know, what we used to call the configuration management engineer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, someone has to have, I mean, you have to have someone that translates between your groups in some way, right? Uh, I don't know that they have to be uh, an expert developer, so I think what we're seeing mostly is the dev team not having to be, the, they don't have to do core coding, but they, again, same thing. The, the ops team is mostly where that bridge gets created from, right? Um, we're seeing, the other place we're seeing this in spades, which is really interesting, is uh, with the proliferation of Kubernetes. We're seeing all these ops teams going, I've got a great cluster for you, and every one of the dev teams like, so what? Yeah, exactly, and thank you? Like, what do you, thank you for giving us. So. Um, we're actually, so that's a place that we've been working a bunch is, uh, it sounds like if you've seen the movie Inception, this is what we've been working, is like ship your Kubernetes cluster with GitLab so that you can give your developers a full end-to-end -end tool chain to put it on your cluster, right? And then the ops team is reaching back to the dev team and saying, I didn't just bring you a cluster and say deploy to it, I brought, you know, I brought you all the tools you need to write your code in your IDE, Right? You should, functionally they should be able to live mostly in their IDE, m touch maybe one other tool. Um, I'm opinionated, so you know which one that is. Um, but you know, maybe two if possible for your devs. And I I'm willing to bet most devs, while they would say if you ask they have an opinion, if they were literally able to be productive, 90% were like, if I can live my IDE and ship code, yay, that's what I want to do. I want to see it affect the, the end. And so. We're actually, again, we spend split time, so we see both, but I think I would encourage, if, you, who's with ops in the room? Who'd say ops? I, yeah, I, I'd encourage if, if your ops teams, I, I think are the ones that are gonna be able to like, offer that back. So I think an ops reaching back to the devs, because of the shift left too, the other challenge is that shift left, like developers are getting very used to being able to make the calls. And so I do think we're seeing it really successful where an ops team brings, you know, 
uh, those tools back to the devs and say, hey, we're gonna make that much easier on you. And if you can answer that question, nine times out of 10, they, are, they seem really happy on that, which is better than the shift left and then you, if your dev teams in, try and enforce it on your ops teams, that's, that's not necessarily, I mean in a small team maybe, but I'd say that wouldn't be the direction. I would try and get your ops teams to reach out to your dev teams. Yeah, that's what I was looking so I would say yes, that, that's a pattern we've seen that works the best. Yeah, good. Okay, anything else? I think we actually have a few extra minutes. I'm, I think you're nope. I ended right on time, so uh, appreciate it. Hopefully this is a little bit helpful. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, if you ever need anything, everything we have is public, so uh, all of it's published uh, from our um, workbook to every one of the slides to everything. We actually also put everything our company calls are on YouTube, so if you ever want something, just search GitLab something and it's probably there for you to use. So please reuse it, that's kind of the fun of this. Um, if it's at all useful for y'all. So, hope that helped. Thank you all. Thank you all.